I usually use just one tool for removing the background and it's this uh, narrow one I was talking about earlier that uh, it's a Swiss made tool it's there number five it's a very shallow curve so that's half an inch wide here's the same maker same stamp on number five but wider this one's not crowned this one is pretty much straight across I don't use it often but it's a good one for here I have that pretty large piece of real estate to take out and so I'm holding it way up like that I'm not holding it up on the handle with my thumb up on the handle and pretty low not steep like that the handle down low and just lightly tapping out that uh, background and I'll do all the refinement with the narrower one and you see the chips break free at the other V2 line now I'll turn around and come towards me so for that I'll hold it in my fingertips like that and swing my mallet around maybe right in your way like that and And up in here, there's enough room for that larger tool here as well. So here's that uh, that other position. I don't know how well those are showing up, but working with the smaller tool, now I can run down that V tool line because the. Um, fibers are here. If I run this way, they're all supported as I cut across them. I don't want to run this way because there's nothing supporting them behind and they'll tear. So I can go like this, cut right down to the depth of that V-tool line, like that. Here it's the opposite. Here I'll do it with hand pressure and if you've heard me talk about this before I usually tell you you're less likely to slip with the mallet more likely with hand pressure but you still do both holding it that same grip and then my right hand on the end of the handle like that. And again, just really that much of that uh, tool I'm cutting with, this part's up in the air. Sometimes you're banking it this way and that. Now I've switched to my left hand pushing the tool, my right hand holding it down, just because of where I'm trying to get and uh, to stay out of the way of the camera. come down here. So always reading the fiber, reading the grain and trying to not run afoul of that grain direction. I didn't talk about the wood at all. This is a piece of quarter sawn oak. So Really very cooperative piece of wood, very straight grain, 
even growth, uh, just everything I need it to be. It's air dried, but that doesn't matter much. So that's how I bring those backgrounds down. And you don't need to watch me do all of that. And I'll get that background down and then do the accents on the foregrounds. Well, the light is changing now. I, I took a break and went swimming. Uh, and I have one last piece to outline with the V-tool and some background to cut. And it's a shape I've never really cut before that sort of truncated leaf shape there at the end of this. So you extend the horizontal stem and then it just flares out in a curved shape like that and is straight across the end. So let's see if I can, um, whoops, there goes my chalk. Let's see if I can cut that. And just like that shape, you know, it's easy to cut one half of it. To cut the second half is the trick. And that's not perfect, but it'll do. Uh, and then just a little background behind all that. So that line got a little crooked. I could straighten that out. That might be a little better. On the earlier version I did of this, I did a different shape there. I don't know why. That hold fast is in the way. I'll go this way. Uh, here comes the neighborhood. main thoroughfare not far from here and the police station isn't far from here either nor the fire station so we get all the excitement to come by here So that'll do that piece. Now to do the um, the details, this one gets is the only one. No, that's not true. This is almost the only one that gets any shaping to it. So I'll take that same background tool and cut a bevel here. And in this one, I'll come up this side of the leaf. Here, I'll go down the other side of the leaf, like this. So I want to see the um, I want to see that corner of the tool in that V tool track. I don't want to lose sight of that corner because then it'll cut the wood in a way that um, I can't control. Now it's switched hands. And you could do this with the mallet too. And it's just that much. It's just a little bit of a bevel now coming down the other way. 
but the same gig keeping that corner in that retool track like that and a little bit of a bevel on that uh, stalk itself and that's just the opposite you go up that side and down this one and now the foliage in all of this stuff is what you've seen me do on uh, if you've seen me carve the panels for this sort of work and A whole series of strikes with that gouge and a mallet. That's a three-quarter inch. Uh, it's a number seven in the Swiss made tools. And then I come right behind it at an angle. So this first cut is the tool is vertical and that's just severing the fibers and the second cut the tool is at an angle and then you rock it left and right to bring out those chips like that And these then have a, an incised cut between them. Like that. So I'll do similar treatment to this leaf and to all three of those leaves. Let me try to get a different angle on that so you can see it. So I'll start in here. And these are just the vertical strikes. And this last one comes right from the tip of that stem. And its neighbor going the other way comes from there as well. And here you'll see, so now I've tilted the tool at an angle. And then rock it left and right to get that to come out. Like that. That one didn't let go. This one did. And then the in-betweeners. as many over here like that I want to add I want to extend this V2 line a little bit like that and that'll get me room for another one there oops that doesn't want to let go sometimes you restrike the vertical as well but That's a stubborn one, you see. There it is. You don't want to flick it up like that because that can tear this up. And now in this leaf, there aren't as many because there's not as much room. If you've uh, lifted that fiber there, sometimes you can just take the tool and press those fibers back down with the bevel, pushing down, not with the cutting edge, but just with the piece of steel to just burnish that back down.
and you can switch to a smaller a narrower tool there or just tilt the tool like that to get those and then the same sort of thing over here and on and on like that this one doesn't get those uh, it gets just a v-tool line um, like this and you can even hook it like that now I have the camera right in my lap so a little hard to get at sometimes but that's all those get and then this original has a, a whole host of punch work on it and a very very small punched impression that I just do with a nail set. Usually I use a really large nail set for these punches, but this one, uh, this particular pattern had a really small impression like that and everywhere. It, it's punched probably a couple hundred times on this pattern and um, even down here where there's no carving really. and along here it's always funny when I look at these and think why did they do all of that and um, and then if I leave it off it looks unfinished to me sometimes they're um, seemingly done with a nail even which leaves a sort of rectangular impression but this one was round so the other leaves get uh, similar treatment and what I'll show you next is how to do the um, the rosette right there I tried to block off some of the window to get a little raking light on this um, rosette which really I guess isn't a rosette it's a pinwheel that's gonna happen there uh, there's lots of different patterns that Thomas Dennis and his shop used for these circles but this one is the simplest um, and I'm going to start with a, a gouge with a pretty pronounced curvature to it and it's fairly narrow half an inch or less and I'm going to tilt, lean it a little bit forward towards the flute there and just strike around the center point to define a very small inner circle and then take that background tool and right near it just cut out coming up to it and that I did you saw with hand pressure and switched left and right hands a couple times and what that does is it isolates that little button there so that hopefully won't pop off 
because now I'm going to hollow this from uh, my pointer from out here, leaving this high and cut down to that depth. And see now the wood breaks free where I made that little trench around the middle. And here I am using the mallet again uh, for caution's sake. motorcycles too. You get everything today. It's summertime so you get all the sounds. Now a little hand pressure but the bulk of the wood has been removed. Down to that depth. There's times when you lose them, when you hit that just, just enough to go ping across the room. This is not one of those times. Now, with this tool or another narrow, small tool, working sort of upside down with the bevel up, you just want to round off that uh, shape. And get a close up so you can see that. So just working, thinking about the grain direction, the fiber direction. Again, I have to go there from what is 12 o'clock on this, that way. And it's just a stroke or two, really, to give that a little three dimensional effect like that. And from there, it's as simple as can be. It's back to that uh, number seven gouge. And now instead of uh, running in a line or in pairs, they radiate around that center. like that and then you come behind one take that chip out like that can't do any more without getting in the way of the camera oops and I don't want to hit the camera so from there, it's just the uh, incised ones that don't get chopped out. And on and on. So that's all there is to that pattern. It's very, very simple. And then I think it, yeah, it has um, the nail set punch around it and even within those pedals. So move the camera, finish that off, and we'll go on to the next part. So the urn, uh, first thing I did is an, an interior V-tool line to create a border around it. And now it's just a couple of um, chops with the gouge. So I'm going to put the center points of those compasses in, uh, in one of these to make it disappear so we don't have to look at it. And then one of them radiates out from the very center, like that, and then one in between. What could be easier? Like that, and that. It's been a while since I've done a carving video and I'm sorry it took me so long to get some raking light on this because now it looks a lot better than it did earlier. 
and then I'll go the other way. Like that to do this business it's all the same sort of thing it's just a matter of where do you fit these and one up there left and right and then they run sort of singletons down like that and here they fan this way and they'll come all the way up here so I'll do one up there And you've got to kind of bend them along like that to get them to try to follow that shape. So that's really the extent of the design here is um, filling it all in with these gouge chops and punches with the nail set and things like that. So there's not a lot of variety to it. There's just that horror vacui. Fill every blank space with this stuff. So I'll finish this up and show you a little bit of the background punch and it'll be done. So the punch work is um, one of the finishing touches and you just, in this pattern, go to town hitting it pretty much wherever you can fit it. You can't have too many, you can have too few. little mind-numbing but um, not the end of the world and these are just light taps so not even a strain on your hearing and that's not the case for the next part which is the background punch there you see the effect of the punch on that background and it really makes a very distinct demarcation between the foreground and the background so uh, well worth the effort to do that let me show you a little bit about the punch it is just a piece of mild steel in this case uh, one quarter inch by half an inch and then a grid of teeth cut in it with a in this case, I used a feather-edged file to just cut a row of whatever. I got three teeth this way, one, two, three, or maybe five that way, and um, and then you strike it with a, a hammer. Let me show you a little bit of that. Contrary to the the punch work with that nail set, this you've got to really give it a good whack. you're just pushing that much more wood 
and uh, so there are times when I organize my work so that I cut about a swath of background and then texture it and then move on and cut some more so that I don't have a solid five minutes of punching. The, the only other thing to say about it is you want to make sure the underside of your panel is well supported that there's no that nothing is you know one side risen up or anything because you can strike that and just snap it right in half uh, so just make sure your panel is dead flat on your bench when you're doing that punch work all right one last last thing that i never talk about in video for sure or even in print i think is a finish and uh, that's because I stink at it. One last thing that I want to show you is um, something I never really cover much in the blog or in these videos, and that is putting a finish on these. Now, I'm no finisher. I opt for, this is linseed oil I'm going to put on here, just as simple as can be. I will paint this one much like I did uh, the practice one for it and uh, maybe show you a separate one about the pigments there but before I paint it I'll oil it and I've got a jar here of um, just linseed oil and uh, one of those modern-day citrus thinners this is some pure linseed oil from a Swedish manufacturer um, and I keep a rag in it and just squeeze the bulk of it out. What you'll see is the way the carving is affected by the oil. All of these cuts really begin now to stand out. All that ingrain we've exposed in the carving um, absorbs the oil differently than the surface does. And just right there you can see the difference uh, of just how prominent the carving comes when you when you put a finish on it. Uh, this is even regard regardless of whether it gets painted or not. Compare the contrast here to once you soak that uh, linseed oil on there. And I just wipe it all on, and then later wipe it all, wipe off all the excess, and the usual uh, cautions apply to the rag. I keep this one uh, submerged in oil, but any that uh, are not going to be so, I soak them in water, and then uh, flatten them out to dry them out. Don't keep them bunched up, and then dispose of them. But I just wanted you to see the effect that that has. Uh, the best way to see it is to look at uh, uh, some oiled part and unoiled part. Oops. Like that. And it makes a world of difference. Then I just take a dry rag and mop up all the excess.
And this is the rag that I have to be careful with uh, disposing of.